Hey, what's up guys, and welcome to the Old Hunters DLC. It's finally here. I think I've played through about a quarter of it so far, and I just want to share that hunt with you. New weapons, new bosses, new NPCs, and hopefully a new understanding of the hunters who were around when the hunt first began. So let's hunt through it all together, and let's see what we can find. Defeat Vicar Amelia, and the messengers will bring you two items. First, the eye of a blood drunk hunter. The pupil has collapsed here, which indicates the onset of the scourge of beasts. A hunter who goes drunk with blood is said to be taken by the hunter's nightmare, destined to wander forever, engaged in an endless, nightmarish hunt. No hunter can escape this fate, apparently. The second item is the old hunter bell. Countless hunters have passed through the dream, but cannot forget the thrill of the hunt. The messengers relay these thoughts, and if you ring the bell by their side, then the hunters are sure to listen, for the night of the hunt is long and unchanging, and this bell closes the gap between worlds. With these items in your inventory, the amygdala outside Cathedral Ward will take you to the Old Hunter's Nightmare, but unlike the Old Hunters before us, we go there as a hunter who has not completely succumbed to bloodlust. That's not what sucked us in. What sucked us in was this creature that we know is capable of teleporting you. Cursed Daphines, their children do, and their children forever true. If there's an answer for that dialogue, I haven't found it yet, I don't know who it belongs to. Who is this woman to place a curse upon people? And what curse is she placing? We should remember this for another episode. We arrive in a distorted version of Cathedral Ward and its surroundings. And maybe distorted is the wrong word though? To me, this area strikes me as badly remembered. Imagine if you had to construct a place from memory. You wouldn't get it 100% correct, would you? And to me, I kind of like to think that whatever hosts this nightmare had trouble remembering the towers in the distance, so the towers appear tilted and illogical, and gaps in memory are replaced by these rocky hills where there should be man-made paths instead. But this world, this nightmare, it's inhabited, just like all the others were. You know, Mikalash's nightmare was inhabited by the puppets that he pulled into the nightmare with him, and also by random hunters who made their way in as well. The geography might be a reconstruction from somebody's memory, but the people within it aren't. This nightmare is full of old hunters, some of the first people to ever fight against the beasts in the first hunts that ever happened. Hunters who, according to the Eye, lost themselves to bloodlust and were pulled into a nightmare where the hunt never ends. And this shows in the gameplay. The hunters and the beasts here are constantly fighting one another, and you can use that to your advantage. The beasts are weak compared to the hunters, but there are so many, so I like to take out the hunters while they're distracted with the beasts, and once you're done with the hunters, you can equip a torch and deal with the beasts. They'll rarely attack you. All of these hunters are wielding weapons and wearing a garb that isn't seen in modern day Yarnum. You'll find pieces of their equipment throughout the early level, and the old hunter garb in particular is funny. Its description details the superstitions of the first hunters. How some hunters believed that the beastly plague crept up the right leg, so they wrapped a bit of belt around the right leg of their trousers. Some thought that bits of metal on their gloves could ward away the beast blood, and you get the picture. They were a superstitious bunch back then. The chess piece tells us that one day the hunters disappeared. Drunk with blood, they would pass on to the nightmare every last one of them. I wonder what's pulling them in. Regardless, these hunters were around in the first days of the hunt, and this nightmare contains people and the places that existed when the hunt first began, and I really think that inside it we'll find the answer to what started the hunt, and why. 
On this little crop of land, we find our first new weapon, which is the Beast Cutter. It's like a crude, more brutal version of the Threaded Cane. The weapon is described as regrettably inelegant, which suggests that the earliest hunts were clumsy and bloody and brutal, which certainly wouldn't have helped these hunters resist the bloodshed. Perhaps the refinement of weapons wasn't just so you could deal with beasts efficiently, it would be so you could deal with them more cleanly. Anyway, the world here is full of twin bloodstone and later bloodstone chunks as well. So if you want to choose a new weapon to upgrade, it could easily be one of these you find in the early DLC. And the DLC continuously bombards you with new weapons, which I really like. It's not like the core game that gives you all the cool weapons at the very end. There are some good weapons at the very start of this DLC and you find a new one what feels like every 15 minutes or so. So far, most of my enemies have been humanoid, not beasts or monsters, so as a result I definitely recommend the blunderbuss over something like the pistol. I've always found that the pistol misses too much against human enemies, like you can't repost them very well, so you might want to go with the blunderbuss, and I find the blunderbuss is better at taking out all the hunters. And if I'm making this look easy, it's because I've been through here before. I accidentally played through all of this stage on a New Game Plus character, and holy shit this area in New Game Plus is tough. Enemies have so many more hit points. I actually got up to the first boss on my New Game Plus character and completely forgot that I was in New Game Plus, but the first boss really reminded me of that. I still haven't beaten the first boss on my New Game Plus character. And I was going to show you guys that playthrough, but my PC decided to corrupt the footage instead. So this character, who's not in New Game Plus, is so much easier by comparison. My recommendation to you guys is that if you have a New Game Plus character, and if it's below level 60, like mine was, don't expect to get past the first boss without a hell of a fight. Choose your character wisely. And look, it's the Cleric Beast. Here comes a boss fight, right? Any second now. Okay, maybe it starts when I pick up the item? No? No? Okay then. Maybe it starts when I leave? No, it doesn't. Didn't expect that. Maybe later? Anyway, the eye pendant the cleric beast was holding reads, unlocks the surgery altar. The next weapon we find is the boom hammer, and it's waiting for you in front of this old guy. Who is the guy that shoots you when you pick up the item in front of him? I'm sure you all remember that trap. I was like, you're not gonna fool me again. Oh, this is different. The interesting part of this weapon reads, crush the beasts, then burn them. The brute simplicity of the boom hammer was favoured by hunters with an acute distaste for beasts. This was crafted by the Powder Keg Hunters, one of the first hunter groups, and a lot of descriptions do reference these groups. Bloodborne already has a fairly straightforward timeline, it's not like Dark Souls, which spans hundreds or even thousands of years. Bloodborne's timeline seems like it happens within a century or so, in my opinion. So this DLC answers a lot of questions about the progression through all the different hunter groups and their history, and we even learn that there is a group that came before the Powder Keg Hunters. And it's this beastly enemy we fight next that gives us this information. He has this enhanced beast hood that I've still yet to learn about. He has a way bigger moveset than the beast claws should give you. I think it's a rune that lets you get into the beast form he's in. Anyway, he's where the central Yarnum lamp would be, where Gilbert would be if this was the real world, and he drops the firing hammer badge, which I believe unlocks the timed Molotov cocktails that you saw being thrown around before, and also the piercing rifle, which was, and I quote, developed by the Oto workshop, which was the workshop that came before the Powder Keg Hunter workshop. You're a hunter with your sanity, aren't you? Must have taken a wrong turn then, eh? Well, we're more alike than you think. This is the hunter's nightmare, where hunters end up when drunk with blood. You've seen them before. Aimless, wandering hunters slavering like beasts. This is what the poor fools have to look forward to. So, don't be brash. Turn back before it's too late. Unless you've something of an interest in nightmares. 
Yes, as it should be. Hunt your beasts and think no more on the secrets of the night. That is the very best a hunter can do. Just don't let the blood intoxicate you. You can say no here. You can say, I'm not interested in nightmares. But then you can also talk to him again to give what is supposedly the right answer, which is apparently, yes, I am interested in nightmares, because he stops talking to you after you say yes. What now? Oh, take my word and turn back before it's too late. Unless, I suppose, you've taken an interest in nightmares. Oh yes, I see. You sense a secret within the nightmare, and cannot bear to leave it be. As if the spirit of Bergenworth lives on within you. Such inquisitive hunters will relish the nightmare. But beware. Secrets are secrets for a reason. And some do not wish to see them uncovered. Especially when the secrets are particularly unseemly. This guy will appear later, and he tells us to carry on further into the nightmare, but he warns us that some secrets aren't meant to be found. Secret type. Down the Blood River is the Gatling Gun Hunter who attacks you in the pitch black with this brutal, brutal weapon that will stun lock you if you stand anywhere near him. I found the best way was to rotate around this rock until he takes a break from firing, then you get a few hits in and you rinse and repeat. His gun can't fire forever, so start your assault on him as soon as it stops firing. You actually get the Gatling gun for defeating him. It requires Blood Tinge and Strength, so I'm going to bet that Blood Tinge Strength builds are going to be a thing now. That weapon is a beast. I really recommend using the Hand Lantern in here. Further on you have to fight a small bloodletting beast, and you'll actually want to see what you're shooting at because it's important to counter this guy with a gun in your left hand. This room holds the Amygdalan Arm, a gruesome little trick weapon that you can use as a short hammer or a sinewy scythe thing where one of the limbs just flows around with the ligament attached to it. From is so creative with their weapons. The next two weapons is the Beast Hunter's Safe, which is way better than I thought it would be. It just looks like a short saw cleaver, but its simplest attacks include a lot of little dashes, and everyone knows how important it is in Souls games to quickly close distances. It's a really underestimated weapon, I think. The next weapon is the Whirly Gig Saw. I love it. Just look at how you can grind down an enemy by holding L2. This weapon belongs to Valta, the Beast Eater leader of the League, and he's the old hunter you meet in the Forbidden Woods if you went and joined the League when Patch 1.07 hit. The League is a co-op covenant, and I'm going to use this guy to help me in my boss fight because I found the boss fight really tough. I haven't had much sleep, so maybe I'm just not fighting very well. But it felt good summoning this guy. This DLC is called The Old Hunters, after all. I might as well summon one of them, right? It was nice feeling like I had a teammate against this guy. So, let's fight that next boss, shall we? Oh. I'm not going to talk too much about the lore in these videos, but just quickly, Ludwig was originally the first hunter of the Healing Church, a cleric who became one of the most gruesome beasts. In the first phase of the fight, it's vitally important that you kind of become familiar with his moveset, and most importantly, I think you have to learn where it's safe to hit him, and where it's safe to heal. I find the best place to be attacking is his left side. 
because if you get behind him, he'll bucket you like a horse. If you get under him, he'll stamp around and likely kill you. And if you get in front of him, he'll do these quick little slashes that are hard to predict and dodge. Inevitably, you do have to dodge through these front-facing dashes, and that's what's so tough. One of these dashes has a really long wind-up that will catch you if you dodge too early, but you have to dodge early against most of his dashes because they will combo you if you just take the hit. So it's a tough fight because of that. You can't dodge too early and you can't dodge too late. Your reflexes have to be on point if you're soloing this guy, which is why I brought Valter in. I decided that this companion hunter was going to be my win condition. He's fantastic for distracting Ludwig. But he only has a limited amount of blood vessels, so once he's healed like five times, he'll stop healing and the boss will kill him and you'll be in trouble. So, like I said, my win condition was to keep him alive. I brought the choir bell along with me and I kept healing Valter whenever he got low, so basically I was keeping my tank alive. I'd never fought a fight like that in Bloodborne before, so this was really fun for me. And I really wanted this NPC for phase two of this fight. <laughs> ah, you were at my side all along. My true mentor, my guiding moonlight. This is awesome. That music transition is so seamless and epic. All of a sudden, Moonlight Greatsword, out of nowhere. But if you did look closely, you would have noticed that Ludwig actually had this Moonlight Greatsword strapped to his back all along. It's fairly easy to dodge the swipes from this Greatsword. If he starts doing slam attacks, you dodge early, and if he starts swiping, you dodge through the attacks. And during this fight, you'll have two chances to repost him to perform visceral attacks. And it took me a while to figure out where to perform the visceral attack, but eventually I realized you have to go right up to his crotch and yeah. The easiest way to die in this fight is if you get caught in his huge charged up moonlight wave attack. He does this quick AOE to make you dodge backwards, but then he follows it up with his slam down that creates this giant wave of moonlight energy that just destroys you. Look how devastating it is. So you've got to dodge away from the initial AoE, and then you've got to get right back close to him again so you can dodge that attack. But eventually, I succeeded. Good hunter. Have you seen the thread of light? Just a hair, a fleeting thing. Yet I clung to it, steeped as I was in the stench of blood and beasts. I never wanted to know what it really was. Really, I didn't. <coughs> <laughs> A tragic figure, but he will shame himself no longer. He died with his ideals untarnished. He was a true hero, and earned that much at least. Do you know why the hunters are drawn to this nightmare? Because it sprouted from their very misdeeds. Things that some would rather keep secret. A pitiful tale of petty arrogance, really. High time someone exposed the whole charade. 